part of the meetup. Today we are going to discuss the day in the life of a beginning data scientist or data professional. For this we had Noah Volker, who was data automation developer of MacDin, previous co-author. We had Housley, he was the software developer from the prototyping team. Then we have also from MacDin, previous term we have Atif Khan, the VP of Data Science and Machine Learning from Message Point, and we have Armand, the uh, uh, sorry team lead from G Space from D Thank you very much all for coming. And cool. So we're going to start off like for the co students explain first what you're studying and actually also what what you're previous data co-op or co-op look like? Um, so right now I'm uh, in my 3B term uh, at the University of Waterloo doing uh, physics and astronomy. Uh, so not necessarily um, the program you would think of for data science, um, but there's still a lot of uh, data analytics statistics, uh, a lot of evaluation of large data sets in uh, astrophysics. Um, and then my previous co-op term was uh, under Mary as the data automation developer. Essentially, I sat at the end of uh, a lot of the pipelines that uh, had been built out by her and the main developer. Um, and I did a lot of analysis uh, for them, uh, worked on a couple different things, uh, creating reference sets for our neural networks, um, and just kind of exploring some of the data that we were uh, kind of pulling out of our search solution. Um, I'm Chauncey, I'm from, also from New York Scott Waterloo, and I'm in math and CS. Uh, first, I was not like under Mary, but for the very last week, I was like joined their team to like finalize a, a final project for our term. And like I try, we try to play with the data quite a little bit and try to find interesting relations between. Yeah, the relationship. Yeah, that yeah. That yeah. It's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. That sounds good. Okay, cool. So, and then for like, I don't know, more experienced people. More Can experienced people? Older? Go, yeah. <laughs> Can you explain your like, yeah, your, your role and like, how so, you work together, like, the, the co ops? So, so I, I think, uh, so I'm, I'm Adav Khan, um, VP for AI Initiatives at Message Point. Uh, I would say these, these guys are invaluable to us. The, the, the energy, the, the, the in, in injection of new material, new ideas that they bring in, is just, it's just nice to see. Uh, over the years we've seen, so I've been hiring in this space for a while, I've seen the quality of the co-ops is increasing. And it's because of the education focus, it's because of the focus of groups like these, and, then, and you guys are also doing a good job. Right? So. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, a couple of people know me here, so that's good. Uh, my name is Armand, and I'm a team lead at Deloitte's Innovation Lab, which is called DSpace, located in downtown Kitchener. Um, are we talking about how my day is, or things like that? Or yeah, also for like how the day will look like, for because you also are managing yeah, So we, calls. the way that we operate is pretty much similar, so we hire uh, a lot of co-ops, and we keep hiring more and more every term. Um, and we, lo we rely on, on co-ops to basically do everything for us. And we believe that the co-op is not a, just a phase of four months for somebody to come in um, and you know, do some groundwork or data cleaning or stuff like that and then leave. Um, at least for the case of uh, my colleagues, the people who work with me, uh, what we try to do is create a way of uh, basically a path for them to learn more and more and also to contribute to the work we are trying to do. So they're basically the core of the team. Everything is around them. We talk about ideas together. We share pretty much everything together. And um, so I have a few of my friends here who, uh, with whom you can talk after this panel. Um, and then they could, they could basically tell you more about this. But the way that we operate is that we have different teams, and each team is comprised of a team lead, and, uh, three, four, sometimes even five co-ops that are focused on solving one specific problem for you know, somewhere within our business, uh, internally or externally. Uh, and then the team leads are basically just technical moderators. Everything is handled by the co-op students. Uh, we have 
more experienced ones who are finishing their masters or PhD programs, and we have less less experienced ones. So we had uh, second year math and computer science students last term. It doesn't mean that less less experienced ones are not as good. Actually, sometimes they're much much better than the people that we were expecting in the beginning. So it really depends on how energetic and dedicated the, the person in the team is going to be and how they're Sorry. going to yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm done? Okay. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> yeah, you should, you should put the timer on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are also going to go for more Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So if you like yeah, what if you have experience with hiring data science? Or data people. Yeah. So, what do you are you looking for in them? Do you look at their education? Do you look like at side projects? Do you look like their potential? So, can you start? Sure, with I'll them? go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. One one of my key qualifications is is passion, right? You have to be passionate about what you're doing, and I can't can't overemphasize this, right? You have to be able to take pride in the work that you've done. Doesn't matter what level of data science work that you're doing and be able to put, uh, present it in front of a set of people, right? Now, uh, there's definitely computer skills that are mandatory, like you, should, you, you must have those, and then I think for me, it, it diverges, right? So if you're doing data science work, there's a different subset of skills that you must have, and if you're doing data engineering work, there's a different subset of skills that you must have. But, but the ability to be able to um, understand, for data science people, the ability to be able to understand the fundamental concepts, grasp the fundamental concepts, and then see how they apply, right? So if we talk about in a team setting, like this is maybe you can go try this. Those are the things that I look for. Anything else can be taught. Right? If you don't have certain certain skills, don't feel that I don't know enough. Bring the passion out. Show that you care, and not just show that you care just by your words, but show that you care by your actions as well. Right? If you don't have enough experience, do something else around it. There's tons of data. There's tons of information that needs to If you're data engineers, you guys you guys have it rough. Uh, you have to know, unfortunately, the, 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 the nitty gritty details that people try to stay away from. Uh, you need to understand how data can be moved, how data can be processed, learn the basic command lines, learn the, the, the basics of the jungle you're in. Right? If you have never touched Bash before, it's time to be master of Bash. Right? If you've never touched like basic servers to store data, process data, it's time to get, get on it and then understand this. Sounds good. And from the student side, how would you prepare, like, or suggest someone to prepare, like, for the co-op in the data field? Maybe I, I can't. Yeah, sounds like, good. Like, I think a good like resume is uh, is an, is necessary for to to apply for a data science job. You need to like list all your like side work or like previous job terms for that related to data science. Like, like. The most, I think, the most important thing is to highlight the skills you use. For example, you use like some like like secular, or like you use some some structure, like or you use some like uh, algorithm in your project. You just listen. Like it is better than the long sentence of uh, description. I think. Okay. Yeah, for me, I think it would be. Um uh, first and foremost with your resume is, is be honest. Um, not everybody has every skill. Um, and, if, and if you don't have experience with something that's under requirements, um, then it's, it's not something that you want to put down. Um, but if, if you are asked about it, it, always be passionate to learn. Um, that's one of the things that I've found is uh, you always need to be ready to learn something new um, and never be stuck in your ways in what you've done before. Um, the other thing is that once you do have um, a job that, that you have prospects for, um, try to explore as much as you possibly can without uh, working an hour at that job. Um, whether that's contacting your manager for uh, online courses that you can take, or things to prepare for, or it's coursework that you've done before. Um, just any way to familiarize yourself before you get into the job, uh, so that you can kind of get that leaping start and uh, you know, get your wings under you when you, when you get in. So if I can maybe just add a slide view to that. If you're, if you're putting your resumes together, and if it's worth putting in your resume, only work, only put it in your resume. If you just dabbled in it, and you're going to put it in your resume, somebody like me is going to ask you a question. Right? And if you're not confident about it, the cookie is going to crumble really, really fast. It's not going to look nice. 
I rather they talk about certain skills that you know really, really well and you've shown some experience in it and try to like cover all of it. So, so whatever you put on your resume, make, make it relevant. Okay, cool, that's good. So this is like kind of finishing off like the interviewing part. Then when you have like, uh, have the job. So like, I think we have all different ways of working. Yeah. So like, you can start a little bit away for like these spaces doing. Mm -hmm. So explain a bit like how the projects are organized and then like how 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 do people work together on so do you build prototypes, do you build something to come into production? Yeah, sure. So um, I, our projects pretty much like everywhere else comes from a problem statement or uh, an idea. Uh, but mainly a problem statement that is coming from somewhere within uh, the world structure. Uh, something that we call different service lines. So most, if not, uh, well not all, but most of our projects are internal. Uh, we serve as an internal software shop from somebody who is looking from outside. Um, but then when we get hit by all of these different problem statements uh, from different service lines, and there is a pipeline uh, that the sole job is basically sitting there and having conversations with all these different people who come with these ideas and uh, filtering them out. So by the end of, so I'm looking at the co-op term for this specific um, example. By the end of a co-op term, we already know a bunch of candidate projects that we're going to start working on the next term. Um, and then once we have that, then uh, we basically get to pick a few of them. Sometimes we only have one per service line, and each service line with us has a pod, which basically is a team that is working on the pro problems or projects of that pod, uh, of that service line. Um, and then again, that pod has a team lead and a few uh, sometimes designers, sometimes uh, full timers, sometimes you know, everybody's a co-op student. And uh, after that, it's basically routine. It's, Sprint planning, uh, going through the sprint, demo pretty much every week, retro, and then uh, so on and so forth, until we end up with a uh, something that is a product, from our perspective, a proof of concept, or a prototype, as Mary mentioned, all the way to a minimum viable product. Uh, but then the, the idea is by the end of this four months period, we have to deliver a piece of software that is going to help resolve a few of the pain points of the people, the stakeholders, or as we call them, the product owners who brought those ideas and problems to uh, our lab. Okay, cool. Is this similar kind of working? So ours is actually very different. Okay. Um, we, we are in a space where we're almost asked to innovate on daily basis, right? And we're not del delivering every four months, which is pretty aggressive, and kudos to you guys. Uh, but we're asked to do things that are challenging. But they haven't been done in the, in the industry before. So more specifically, I come from a customer communication management space, which if you guys don't know, these are the annoying letters and statements that you get from your uh, banks and financial institutes. And so companies that want to mass, uh, communicate with their clients in a, in a mass capacity use our platform. So we're looking at across multiple languages, content across multiple languages, content across multiple formats, and how to make sense out of it all, right? So my group, uh, it's, it's a good mixture of um, different levels and the different skill sets. So people are specialized in image processing, people are specialized in content processing, and then we sit down and say, okay, so how do we do, let's say, things like multilingual semantic similarity using this, this type of data, right? And then the projects tend to go on for a while, and, and, but the whole team's involved. Like, everybody's chipping in, everybody's chipping in a small piece, and then in the end, it all comes together, right? And then hopefully, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite involved on a day-to-day -day basis, so I got my hand in it and almost all the pies just to make sure that all the pieces are coming together well. But it's about innovation, I think, okay. finding the solutions. Okay, cool, sounds good. And then, yeah, you guys were actually part of like two different sets of teams, so no, when you, you start with your Yeah, so um, on Mary's team, uh, we were a very small team. There was me, um, there was uh, a lead developer, and there was Mary, our manager. Uh, we had a product manager to that handled all of our projects. Um, and essentially on a bi-weekly sprint basis, um, we would come up with uh, a set of problems or a set of uh, issues that we wanted to tackle. Um, and for me, a lot of the time, that was internal tools, uh, finding, again, pain points, uh, whether it was on the team or outside of the team, uh, where I could improve something or fix something or debug something. Um, 
And I think for me, I always have to be ready to um, just take on something new. Uh, a lot of the time, there's things that I necessarily hadn't heard about, or things that um, I, you know, I had to be kind of on my toes, which is a very, a very good thing. It keeps you, um, it, it keeps your, your work exciting. Uh, every sprint is different. Um, so yeah, for me, I was, I was in constant communication with Mary and uh, our lead developer, uh, which was a very good thing too. And uh, just making sure that I'm meeting their needs. And uh, I was also making my life a little bit easier too. So uh, kind of just making people's lives easier um, and uh, making sure I'm a part of the team as much as possible. Yeah, for me, I was also like I'm also in a very small team, which is only my manager Adam and, and me. But we have a very quite different structure of plan. Like uh, we don't have any spring plan because because we don't like spring plan. We just like when I begin this culture, we are we will build everything on our like partial finished per. No project and into it is uh, like a source of data and we need to use this project to generate new data. So first part we we need to uh, we need to like fix the old project. Meanwhile, we also need to like use this project to generate new data for like new prototype like proof of concept. So so like we just have no spring plan, but we like meet. I meet with my manager uh, like every week to like check our check our like like how how is uh, where is our project now and what's the next week's job for for me yeah okay. cool okay nice and so uh, second last question actually and then i will open it also up to the audience so like what is like one of the things that enjoyed you the most or surprised you the most actually of your follow-up yeah for me i think um <coughs> Kind of, kind of a little cliche here, but uh, finding the pictures in, in the data, um, I found uh, a lot of the time, and I hadn't been in a, a call position before that dealt with the number or the quantity of data that we were dealing with. Um, so a lot of the time, it felt very abstract. It felt like uh, I was sitting, you know, at distance from the data. And a lot of the time, I could pull out some really meaningful uh, numbers or insights or analytics um, that are helpful to me or helpful to the team. Um, Bob and I can kind of speak to that too. We had a bit of a project near the end that uh, ended up going well. Um, but yeah, that was the thing that surprised me most is uh, the satisfaction of finally getting that picture. Uh, whether it's what you were looking for or what is to, it's not what you're looking for. Um, a lot of the time it, it sometimes just pops out. Uh, it's a great feeling when that does happen. So it's a good surprise for me. Yeah, for me, it's the same like when I do something like for image processing, like allowing some pictures quite successfully, I feel like a great feel, feeling of achievement. And I also like like the part like at the very beginning, I my manager sent me some papers like related papers to read, and we need to try some new ideas on that paper. And I also like the part that we that that the whole work is to read some papers. That is pretty good. Okay, cool. That's good. And then some. Final question for you two guys. Also, like, what would you suggest, like, for the people who really want to get started in data? Can I add one more surprise? For yeah. Well, so, maybe two. Yeah. First of all, uh, it was really surprising when some the ideas that I had really worked. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Even more surprising than uh, yeah. some of the ideas that I thought they're not going to work, and they were initiated uh, from the co-ops that were working with me, and they actually worked really, really well. So I learned a lot from that. But uh, the question was about... Yeah, how about you would suggest? <coughs> suggestions. You, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe a few, uh, but I'm just going to <coughs> mention them and then we can have a conversation okay. afterwards. One is a rule of thumb that pretty much everybody here, I think, have heard about it, but not a lot of people apply it. If you have 70 to 80% of the skills that is mentioned in the uh, job advertisement, and you don't have the rest, don't feel that you're not eligible to apply. Do it, please. Nobody is 100% under requirements. Not even the person who's hiring you. <laughs> Believe me, I've done it. <laughs> so that's one. Uh, number two is uh, something that I've personally done and seen, and it works. 
um, if you are going for an interview, um, you don't need to spend a lot of time going through all of these questions about interviews at Amazon and blah, blah, blah. If you have time, do it, please. But get to learn the business of the company you're applying to. And if you have time, even if it is an hour or two, write 10 lines of code that would show that you are capable of solving a very small problem for that business. Even if that problem is already solved in the business, when you go into an interview with something that you could demo, you will stand out, no matter what it is. You have mind is get crazy. fired. <laughs> yeah, I have seen people who come yes. in with a single Jupyter notebook and get basically vocally you know, hired. So you, they will just tell you that, hey, just wait for an email from us with an offer letter in about a week's time. And it really works. And number three is if you get hired and you don't like what you are doing or you think that you're not an important person in the team, please talk to the person who is your manager. Their job is just to be there for you. That's the most important job of a manager. If you don't like what you're doing, if you think that you could be better somewhere else in that team, don't wait until six months after or the end of your co-op term or you name it. Talk to somebody and ask them to solve the problem because if you can't work, that business is not going to be successful. I think, no, I think you've said pretty much everything. Uh, what I would add to that is have a clarity. Do you want to be a data scientist or do you want to be a data engineer? Um, don't, don't, don't live in between world that maybe I can be this and maybe I can that and maybe pick up skills uh, as you go along. If you have a career in mind, then, then, then follow that, right? There's different skill sets that you need for both of them, and then there's, there's different way you prepare for them. Um, passion is uh, one of my key key players. Uh, she was, she's, and she's giving talks here as well, uh, was not in data space at all. She was in finance. She decided that she wanted to be in data space. That was her decision. And then did work on her own, applied to Western, got into the data analytics program, master's program there, and was a graduate from that program. Right? But that, that shows to me that she was an issue. Had zero experience in the, in the field. But I ended up hiring her. And now she's working on this full time. Right? In your mind, and it's tough to see, like, okay, so where, what do you mean in my mind see that, that vision? But in, my, in your mind, have some clarity of what you want to be. That's going to help you when you talk to people, and it's going to help you when you're actually learning the rules and then talking about things. I, uh, if you have 10 lines of code and you can demonstrate something about us, uh, I'll, I'll hire you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I found you all the job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just going to add, um, if you're really starting off, like I was uh, coming in to Mapton, um, yeah, a lot of the time, for me at least, I felt pressured to uh, start a side project, which is a great thing to do. Um, and when you're doing that, uh, look at the things that you already do and, and try and build something around that um, because you can really draw a lot of passion uh, from something you're already passionate about. For me, that was, um, I played a bass guitar uh, and I read text-based tabs online all the time. Um, and I thought, this is just a bunch of data sitting there free for me to use. Um, I don't need to bother with API keys and developer keys. I can just go and extract it. It's a bunch of lines, a bunch of numbers, I can pull it out. Um, and I was manually doing that all the time. Every time I went to go practice, I was extracting those numbers, I was extracting the notes, I was cleaning up the tablature that was written by somebody else, and I thought, hey, that could be done in Python. Uh, so it's it's very easy to be passionate about something if you are already passionate uh, about the underlying concept, so I really um, recommend finding something like that if you're going to do a spy project. Yeah, the same, like, functionalize your like, stuff as much as possible. Like, you, you can do it like just like knowing the daily life is pretty cool, I think. Okay, cool. Okay. Are there extra uh, questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, so what are, uh, what are the latest and greatest uh, frameworks and visualizations? So the, this, is a, this is a very broad topic. Is it like, are you guys using a lot of AI frameworks or is it JavaScript frameworks for visualizing stuff? Or I'm curious what's the the bleeding edge of the last year that that's everyone's talking about. Can I answer on it? Sure. Yeah, I, just yesterday I found something in, in <laughs> Mathematica is pretty cool. Like some, like not in Python or JavaScript, some in Mathematica or Mathematica is good to like do the visualization of data. <coughs> you can put plot, plot points with distance, like things 
like norm of course normalize the distance and point, uh, plotting in a 3D cube and with some clustering like people Python. It's pretty good. It's, I think it's in Mathematica. Is that like industry standard now or? I don't know. Or, but it's, you guys work in Bash most of the time for everything? Or? Yes and no. So I think what I would say is more important than learning a specific tool. I think it's, and I've said this multiple times, no databases, right? Uh, our, our group almost always looks at all the uh, relevant research that comes out of different conferences, academic conferences. A few months later, and it's, it's really nice and really fast, they put very simple implementation toolkits that also come out, right? The challenge we have is whatever you're doing it, whatever your <coughs> toolkit that you picked up, can you deploy it? Can you go into production with it? For me, that's a one like, key question, right? It's not just somebody who wrote a little project and now that algorithm is not available. We can we implement our own algorithms if we have to. Is that can you put it in production, right? And if yeah, you can't so put it in production, like everything's very custom. There's no frameworks out there. No, there's a lot of frameworks yeah. out there, right? And then the challenge is like there's too many of because there's a lot of implementations. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff that I've stayed stayed true to um, for for Elasticsearch, it solves so many different problems. For me. uh, Spark. If you haven't learned it, learn it. Like it's just, the stupid computer is destroyed, it's, it's almost a no brainer right now. You need to learn it, right? Um, JavaScript, um, there's a lot of visualizations. I am not a UI person, right? So I'm probably the wrong person. I'll take care of that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just go on with your uh, Kafka and everything that I do. No, Kafka and <laughs> everything else. And then, then I think, we, so we are mostly deployed in AWS. There's a lot of good stuff in there for AWS already, right? So the, 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 the numbers game become do you want to invest, let's say, two months, four months, six months, and then write something on your own, and you just want to pay for this API? And use it? Right. So, so don't. There's a lot of good stuff already out there that you can potentially. Use. Just, I think it's too much. My focus has been, what can I go into production? Thank you. I think your question was specifically about visualization, so I'm going to go in that direction, but it is going to cover it. So, my last role within Deloitte, but not in this team. I was part of a team, uh, part of a project that was supposed to design a dashboard uh, for a specific reason. So I'm not going to talk about the internals of the project, but we had to do it in Tableau, uh, which I thought it's going to be standard for the uh, Four months, in, four and a half months into the project, one of the stakeholders left the firm, and that was the senior one. And a new person came in and said, I want everything to be transformed into Power BI. Four and a half months. That being said, there are frameworks that standard and everybody uses everything. Uh, I personally am a fan of D3. Yeah. I pretty much do everything in D3, even if I can do it uh, with one-tenth of the amount of code that I have to write using any other library in JavaScript. But if you're just, just doing Python, there are all these. Okay, and see more and everything else. It doesn't matter what you're using, as long as you know why you're doing something in that language or in that framework or in that uh, module or so on and so forth. If if you're asking me, um, if I don't know why I'm doing something, it's most probably going to fail. Okay. I could uh, add one more comment. So one other aspect of data visualization is again as as reflected by the panel what exactly you want to do. So if you want to just create a dashboard and provide information via the data uh, prepared in a manner that can be consumed, then there are data visualization tools like uh, Tableau and Power BI are very effective and they are excellent as well. Even something like Excel could actually serve the purpose. If you want to do data exploration and for that you need to get insights in a visual manner, then you have to use a Python-based library, for example, Seaborn. That's, that's getting a lot of popularity. So you could use Seaborn while you're exploring data, while you're trying to get some insights, and then you're using the API which Seaborn exposes, and just changing different parameters and getting different kinds of insights on the end of view. If you want to come up with your own custom visualization, which is you know, pretty advanced stuff, something like B3 is amazing. You can, it's, it's incredible the amount of, I mean, you're just limited by your imagination with B3. That is, that is amazing thing about it. So if, if you master something like B3, your visualizations could be exceedingly effective. It could be incredible. And a lot of media companies want to uh, get that competitive advantage. They want to differentiate themselves based on the visualizations that they provide. So B3 allows them to do some pretty incredible stuff.
And for us, like we mainly use like Kibana, so the layout mm -hmm. dashboard. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. And sorry, sorry, what was that? Kibana. Kibana. So that's Kibana. That's the visualization part on top of Elasticsearch, and that allows you to really quickly like get. It gets you dashboard. almost 60, 70 percent up with almost minimal effort, right? Yeah. Like you can, you can. It's pretty fast. Nice. And everything is templated, so it's like. One of the things too is uh, there's a treasure trove of information um, on current technologies just in job descriptions. Um, I'm currently in the, the University of Waterloo's uh, co-op job work, um, and I see the same visualization and tools and technologies popping up over and over and over again. Um, so uh, to, my advice would be to take a look at some of the jobs that you want to take a look at um, and just see what uh, those companies are using, you'll you'll see patterns kind of emerge out of those descriptions. Okay. That good. Next question, George. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I know that the machine learning uh, learning methods are not 100% bulletproof, so I'm still puzzled uh, how we can deploy in production a, a, a tool or something that's not 100% bulletproof. So I'll give you another example. You can write code. Right, which is a deterministic code, but can have errors in there. That's also not 100% guaranteed to work, right? Because a lot of times, even handwritten code doesn't work 100% of the time, right? So there's measure measurements that you can potentially do on the in the algorithms, the modules that you predictor models that you're building. You have to do your due diligence in terms of figuring out what the performance is like, right? What and and, and can you be confident with it? A lot of times, in our case, it's not just can I be confident with it if, if, if for a specific use case. Maybe I'm, I'm good enough to be tolerant of that error that's going to make. But the gain that I'm getting, the extra gain that I'm getting out of it, the problem is so complex I'm not even writing code. Or maybe building a classifier within hours as opposed to spending two weeks with somebody coding it, right? There's a lot of pros and cons that you need to vary. I don't think there's perfect code in either direction. Right? It doesn't matter if you're handwritten, it doesn't matter if you're going to come. Now, for machine learning specifically, there are statistical measures that you can apply to understand what, what these two doing. So I would say fall back on that. Don't just say, I got a new shiny classifier, polish it up, pack it, and give it to somebody to deploy it. It doesn't work. Yeah, I'm kind of saying, what I'm saying is that every model is wrong, but some are useful. You know what I'm saying? I think it's useful say, to answer a question. Good question. Other questions? I have another one. <laughs> Um, if you said that you do with like uh, you deal with important problems, important problems, yeah. So I can, if you can uh, disclose, can you give some examples? I mean, they are fundamentally sure. machine learning, or like from the user uh, requirements or. Uh, no, so I think in our case, uh, we're in the space of um, content, and content is text and images, and we're we're innovating what, what I'm terming as content intelligence, right? So when I look at information, I'm not just looking at textual information, I'm not just looking at uh, pictures, I'm trying to figure out the semantics behind them, I'm trying to figure out the deep connection. Right? So it's as simple as that if you're sending out a flag to somebody and says have a nice, uh, wonderful time on your study vacation, and you put a picture of uh, in that, in that flag that's not a study vacation, there's a semantic mismatch of information. Right? So how do you measure that? And then you multiply that across the different type of segments that you need to target. Right? So how do you talk to young people, how do you talk to uh, middle-aged people, how do you talk to how do you engage with different segments, and then how do you engage with these people in multiple languages, right? Just having translations done is not enough. Like, how do you ensure that there's a co consistent corporate tone that's coming through, through all your messaging, right? So those are really, really hard problems. Uh, the fundamentals are there, like in, the, in, in academia, and then we also actively go out and look for research partners in, in other universities. So we're working very closely with experts in the field and also experts in academia to solve this problem. So in, in our case, it's like really dream of a new algorithm, dream of a new approach to say, does, does this work or not? Uh, thanks. So thanks uh, for all the value information. You start exploring the uh, technical skills that you would look into in a data scientist versus a data engineer. But I'd like to maybe explore further what, what would be a uh, perfect resume or what kind of technical skills and soft skills that you look for in a data science? So first, I guess, one thing, I'll just tell you the first thing. There's no perfect resume, right? <laughs> resume just gets you in. You get a job because you talk to someone, right? Uh, I, I have tried hiring co-ops by, by put, like, putting questionnaires in front of them. I've hired people with this basically, so you've done this and this, and come work for me, right? 
the, the most successful hires that I've had is through my conversation with them. That 20, 30 minutes that you, you actually let them explore and let them explain what they've done, that conversation is very valuable. So let me take it back maybe a step before that. Yeah. Prior to inviting them for the conversation, you're going to yeah. look at the resume. Which resume rings a bell with you? So that's a tricky bit. It depends on your connection. So coming up to events like this definitely gets you in, right? Sure. Uh, unless you publish something that's so extraordinary, people will just come to you at that stage, right? You wouldn't be going to do it, right? But it really depends on, a, a, a resume through a headhunter, most of the time doesn't really work, right? You look at it, because it's almost everybody's like that, right? If there's just a, there's a whole bunch of boards that are on a piece of paper and they're all talking about the same skills, it's really, really difficult to say, I'm going to take this person out this person. Right? And then you get into this conversation, okay, so he's not here and he's here, whatever. I actively don't do that. I look out and, and people that I want to talk to, I either by referral or, and see, Mary and I had a conversation like, I'm looking for an intern, but I don't want to hire a proper resident. I want you to recommend somebody to me, right? Um, I have a very specific problem which requires a very specific type of skill set, and I knew Mary had, what is it, inter in touch with people that are, right? So build your, build, build your connections. That's right, but at the same time, resumes do work. Right, it's not like they don't work at all. They do work, but but I think resumes just get. Thank you. So I'm honestly more curious about what it, what does it take from a technical perspective for someone to be a successful data analyst. So they're hired right now. They're in the work. Um, what is it that they should really have have, have you know under the disposition to be to perform as a good data analyst? So in a data scientist, I look for key markers. Can you take a, just an experiment on your own? Device it, report it, have you done any publication? Right? So to me, those are all key markers that you can carry research on your own. If I give you a specific problem, you can walk away, read a couple of papers. I also uh, interested in, the, in, can you read a paper and implement that algorithm, right? Those are things that I look for. And if you don't have one, that's okay. As long as you have the coding skills required to say, okay, now I can maybe spend a couple of weeks. But those are key markers I look for in a data science person. A data engineer person is very different. Uh, they, they, I guess as I said before, they need to be able to breathe and live in the, 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 the AWS command lines and, and ingestion pipelines, and, right? So there's a lot that you can do to just showcase that. So for the coding aspect, are we talking you know, short scripts or like 300-line you know, programs? No, something meaningful, something impactful. Doesn't matter if it's 300 lines or 300. Uh, maybe it's just two lines, right? Is that uh, five? Thank you, five. Well, ten. ten. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I think the, the distinction between data science and data engineering, at least nowadays, is getting pretty clear. Um, but before I go into answering a question, to anybody who is sitting here, there is a uh, post on Medium, I can't remember who published it, but if you look for the title, something along the lines of why should you be a generalist data scientist? Something like that. But if you look for the terms generalist data scientist, you will find them. Uh, I found the article really helpful, and I suggest that you shouldn't be a generalist anything. I think not I a generalist it. blockchain developer, not a generalist data engineer, not a generalist full-stack developer. But at the same time, you should know you should know the general skills to be any one of them. Uh, in the case of data engineer, I had a conversation with somebody who said that he's a data engineer, but never tried, let's say, for the case of conversation, never tried a one to one his personal computer. So everything was in Windows. Are you a great data engineer? Exactly. Plus if you don't know the in and outs of batch and everything else, uh, on top of that, I would say you have to know at least one of the, one of the major cloud-based service providers well enough. Uh, you don't need to know everything about everything, but if you haven't deployed anything, let's say on AWS or GCP, Forager, or some, some other provider, uh, then I personally don't consider that person as a data engineer. Now, that's for a full-time person. Uh, for a co-op or intern, it's a little bit different. I think having a clear thought process and being able to, uh, very similar to your uh, your answer about being able to, uh, let's say, 
we uh, implement a paper. Yeah. For a full timer, definitely. For an intern, not necessarily. If you can think about the problems that I'm communicating to you for 10 seconds, two minutes, doesn't matter. And then get back to me with a potential solution, I think that's an indicator of the opportunity for us to work together. Potential. Yeah. But if you if you can't do that, I think from an algorithmic perspective, that person is not there yet, to be honest. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Two, two last questions, and then. Uh, I'm always confused between uh, yeah. definition of machine learning and uh, data science rule. Yes. So machine learning and what? Data, data science. Data science? Okay. So, so like, is data science the super set of machine learning kind of? So machine learning is a toolkit that gets you to solve the data science problem. It's not, it's not, uh, machine learning term itself is overloaded these days, right? Uh, it's the, the, in my case, it's the ability to be able to deal with the quantities of data that you can possibly look at with yourself, right? If the data is like thousand records, and then you sample like let's say a, a subset of that, you can potentially go through that yourself, right? You don't really need machine learning techniques to, to correct that data. But if the if, if you're looking at a billion rows and even if you were to subsample them, you're still looking at a couple hundred thousand things that you look at, that's out of your capacity to, to effectively afford to work. That's where machine learning techniques come in. Uh, there's other things like for example, if data is not clean, if data is is, is, is missing and there's no statistical algorithm that we can apply. To, to to overcome that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to understand that, like, how do I impute things? How do I say, okay, so now in the, in the absence of this value, I'm gonna treat this person as a male, right? Those type of things. Uh, some of it comes just comes from you knowing your data, some of it, but some of it comes from just knowing the basics of stats and, 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 and. Yeah, right. So I have a question about the machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Uh, what is So you can think of little rectangles on a page, and we were trying to figure out like how to cluster content together, right? Now, a lot of clustering algorithms that are taught in school, they're point-based clusters, right? So there's no depth and height to these objects that you're clustering. The distance functions that you apply are not the same distance functions that you would apply to these polygons that are clustered. Right? So it's not that you are now discovering a new clustering algorithm. What you're trying to do is like, how do I morph the known clustering algorithm that I already know, and how to change the distance functions so that they are more effective. You can potentially just work with a point wise, like top left corner, top left corner, but maybe that doesn't work because your text doesn't fold out. Right? Or maybe your pictures and your headers and your, whatever formatting you look at, maybe that doesn't fold out. Right? So maybe I can just take the, the, the middle, middle section of this, this out there, uh, uh, rectangles. Maybe that doesn't work either. So, so this is the ability, ability to figure out, okay, so what's the new distance function? The ability to even know that you have to now go and change the distance function to do clustering properly in the object you're looking at is, I think, the data science part. So that, you don't have to necessarily invent new things all the time. It'd be cool if you can, but, but data science work is not just like, okay, so I got a new algorithm, I got a new algorithm, I got a new paper, right? It's, it's, <laughs> Did you have a situation where you underestimated the effort for a project or it eventually failed, or what, what was the cause of that? Eventually failed? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, we, we don't talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's not, so I think failure is learning. Right? We fail in every day, I, I agree with it, right? Every day we fail something, and it didn't work out, didn't work out, we tried it. So, but what are the learnings from that, right? A lot of times the failures start from the fact that you didn't know what you were working with, right? You didn't know the data well enough, right? So I would say if you don't, if you didn't know your data well enough, go look at your data. Maybe your core assumptions about your data were wrong, right? So maybe you, you I'll, I'll give you an example. So we were looking at life, uh, life event detections uh, and more specifically, marriage detections from or marriage events from from Twitter. Uh, 
Uh, the, the guy who went out and got a sample data only got sample data for the same month for the, for five years, right? But it was, I think, some horrendous month that nobody gets married. <laughs> so I'm looking at this data, I'm like, well, what's going on? The, the, the marriage events are almost not there, right? It's not, it's not every, people are still getting married. And I looked at it and I realized that this, this, this sample was wrong, right? So know your data, maybe verify your assumptions about the data, and then just be, be ready to explore. You will fail, right? But learn. Cool. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. There's a one more Sure, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so is building chatbots a skill set that a data scientist should have? Building chatbots? Or, in, or automated bots? Uh, no, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Depends why. What are you using yeah. Yeah. to build a chatbot? Yeah, okay. That's the question. Building a chatbot is not a data science skill. Right? What you do with that is, is perhaps. Because chatbots are machine learning, I understand. So, so again, data science is not just machine learning. I think that goes back to the question over there. Uh, you, you solve machine learning, but using machine learning, you say it's solved data science problem, but it's not the other problem. But it would be interesting to see what you're doing with chatbots. <laughs> uh, I would say, again, depends. So if you are creating a very simple data set and putting it on dialogue flow, that's not even machine learning, let alone data science. Uh, and this might actually answer your question as well. To me, machine learning is applied statistics. And data science is an emergent activity, an emergent process that happens to use machine learning in some of its steps. Um, if you build a chatbot and try to record the conversations, log them, and learn something from it, yes, that's a data science skill. If you're just deploying it somewhere, that's a um, software developer, Plus, maybe if you're deploying it on cloud, a little bit of data engineering, that's it. But if you're just building a chat, chat box and running it on your local host, no. If I can add one, one, uh, one sentence. So, you could have a chat box that has rules. It's a rule based chat box. They actually just have these fit and six straight things, and you have hundreds of them. If the chat box says hello, then you come up with a, uh, an answer. If it says, I was bothered with this, then you come up with an answer. That's how personal chat box are made. Like, a little more sophisticated, but that's a general idea. So any solution can have a rule based. Uh, any problem can have a rule based solution. Right? That is not what you say. You solve the problem, but you do not apply machine learning techniques in order to solve the problem. Machine learning techniques are a separate set of uh, techniques, algorithms, implementations, and so forth that can be used to solve a problem in order. Uh, and they have particular uses. So just to, you know, you could solve a problem with defensive statements, you could solve the same problem with machine learning. The sphere is still the data science uh, problem. Chatbot is not artificial intelligence. <laughs> now we're going in the realm of AI. No, <laughs> no I would say that. Uh, I think it's more of an apply. What you do with it, what content, what you do with the content, how, how you actually generate the content that chatbot is using, the chatbot in itself as, as, a, as, a, as a token and an implementation is not AI. Right. You you make it smarter, you make it better by applying different types of AI techniques to it. But it could be implemented in different ways as well. And even AI is the, what we uh, understand AI to be today is very different from what AI was supposed to be in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. Because at the 80s it was more symbolic based, uh, symbolic based AI. Right now it's more uh, deep learning based uh, AI. And I'm just relating what was said that machine learning is mostly like um, physics. Uh, principle applied, yeah, but uh, artificial intelligence is uh, it's more above uh, algebraic statistic data processing, yeah. It's uh, rules and logic. I mean, it could we, we do a lot of work around what, what I call knowledge engineering. Right? So, for example, we apply natural language processing technique, which are basic stats, but and extract information out of it, so little pieces of information. But then, what do you do with? It? You have to build knowledge graphs to make sense of it. So, so with AI is, is that encompassing all, not just NLP here or machine learning based tokenization or whatever, it's what you do and how you connect with those dots. There's a lot, it's a much richer, bigger piece. So the most successful um, stories in AI a couple of decades ago were within the realm of expert systems and case-based reasoning. 
Not anymore. Nobody really, you can use them to solve the problem, but that won't be good enough. Because the problem is the same, but the data that you're going to use, or the data that you're going to get from the audience of that problem is changed. So I would say, it's, if it's just an expert system or a rule-based system, it's no longer considered to be AI, even though it used to be a subset of AI a couple decades ago. Cool. That's a nice way to close our discussion. So I want to thank Noah, Bob, uh, Atif, and Armand for participating in the panel discussion. You can still stay around here a little bit to ask some questions with each other. And thank you very much for coming.